I'm very excited to be here with all of you uh, this morning, the week before Back to School Sunday, kind of the calm before the storm. I know that for some of you, you've been counting down the days till this moment, right? You uh, can't wait until you get some peace and quiet around the house. You get some moments to yourself. But I know for other of, others of us that the, uh, the school season brings even more busyness to our lives. We have three kids, and all three of those kids are in three different extracurricular activities. And so you're still trying to figure out the logistics of how exactly that's going to work. How are you going to get your kids to where they need to be, and who's going to take them home? And worst case scenario, they call an Uber, right? And uh, <laughs> you'll figure it out. And then for others of us, summer is not really a thing anymore. Summer hasn't been a thing for a very long time. Your life now is just week after week after week of work and busyness and exhaustion. And the only reason you know that it's August right now is because it hurts to be outside. <laughs> and so this morning, I want us to just take some deep breaths and I want us to relax and I want to talk about rest. Specifically, I want to talk about Sabbath rest which is something that I think a lot of us know that we need, but it's very difficult to prioritize. And so my prayer is that the Holy Spirit opens our eyes this morning to see that Sabbath rest is absolutely vital, not just for our physical and our mental health, but it's vital for our spiritual health as well. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to get going. Father, I just, uh, I'm just so thankful for moments like this where... Your spirit is truly present. You could feel it during that worship moment. Father, and I pray that your spirit continues to move in this room using every single word that comes out of my mouth for your good purposes to do transformational work in people's lives. Father, and I pray that we understand the truth that rest is possible and true rest can be found in you. Father, we love you and we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So about seven or eight years ago, I, for the first time really in my life, experienced that feeling of being so completely exhausted, so depleted of everything, all of my energy, that I actually flipped into an entirely different person. It was my first year here on staff at Faithbridge. I was the junior high pastor at the time, and I had just run my first ever Pine Cove retreat, where we take like 100 plus junior high students over to Pine Cove Outback for a weekend of worship and fun and praying that no one breaks a bone or gets lost. And the weekend itself went great. Like there are tons of worship, building relationships, no one broke a bone that year. And it was, just, it was just a really amazing time. But when I got home, I was absolutely exhausted. I had nothing left in the tank. And my wife, Kathleen, she and I had only been married for about three months at that point, and she had never seen me like that before. She had never seen me just so completely empty. But she knew, because she's awesome, she knew that when I got home, I would want to eat something really unhealthy, and then I would want to watch the Texans versus Packers game that was on that afternoon. Now, this is back in 2011. If you're a Texans fan, you'll remember that that was like one of the first years that we were actually good. And we were, we were relevant in the league. And I think we were riding uh, a, like a winning streak going into that game. And this was going to be our first true test to see how good we really were. And in true Texans fashion, we absolutely crumbled under the pressure, <laughs> which didn't help that feeling of exhaustion and stress that I had. And then to make matters worse, I was watching the game on one of those antennas, those flat antennas that you can just hang on your wall almost looks like a picture frame, and the signal kept going in and out during the most pivotal plays. It came in crystal clear during every commercial break somehow, <laughs> but every time Matt Schaub dropped back to throw the ball, the signal would go out. And every time that happened, my frustration and my anger just grew and grew and grew until it reached a boiling point. When Matt Schaub dropped back, the signal went out, and then it came back in just in time to see a Packers player running the other way with the ball. And that was it for me. I exploded. I jumped off the couch and I grabbed the antenna off the wall. I swung it around my head and I just <laughs> smashed it on the ground. <laughs> my poor wife, just looking at me in horror, wondering like, what kind of psychopath did I marry? And so we just stood there in silence 
for a moment, me over the corpse of my old antenna. Until finally, I go and I put on my flip-flops and I grab my wallet and I grab my keys and I get to the door and I turn to Kathleen and I say, I'm going to Walmart to buy a new antenna. And I left. <clears throat> Now, I'm not normally one to have outbursts of anger like that. Like, truly, that's not really who I, who I am, and I really don't ever Hulk smash anything like that. But I had reached the end of my rope. I was done to the point where I turned in to just a completely different person. I wasn't me anymore. And so later I had to apologize to my wife, and I had to go and spend $30 on a new antenna that I shouldn't have had to buy. But then worse than that, I was just in this really dark place where everything just seemed awful. Everybody was annoying me. Everyone was in my way. Nobody could move fast enough. I just, I felt like I hated everything because I was so overwhelmed. I was so exhausted. I was stressed out. So I decided the next day that, you know what, Adam, you need to take a day off and have a day that's for you. You need to treat yourself. That's what you need to do. And that's what I did. So I took the next day off. I, had a, I slept in. I had a real big breakfast. And then I decided, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend some time playing video games. 20 minutes later, and my controller is across the room. My cats are scattering in every direction. So you know what? Video games are too stressful right now. Uh, you know what? I need, I need to watch a movie. I need to chill out and just watch a movie. A couple movies will calm me down. And so an hour later, and I'm still scrolling through Netflix because nothing looked good. Everything looked terrible. I didn't want to watch anything. And so then I ended up just, just mindlessly surfing the internet for hours, web page after web page, until... I looked and it was dark outside and the day was over. And so my day of rest turned into a day of just frustration and mind-numbing boredom. And when I went back to work the next day, I was even more tired than I was before and I was still feeling just incredibly anxious. Why? I think it's because what I needed in that moment was not more me time. What I needed was Sabbath rest. And don't get me wrong, like there's nothing wrong with having a little bit of me time. Right? There's nothing wrong with occasionally taking a day off work to just recharge your batteries. But that is not the same thing as Sabbath rest, or what Scripture calls entering into God's rest. And if we, ever, if we want to avoid getting to that dark place where we're just overwhelmed, where we're stressed out, where we're completely depleted, then we need to make a regular practice of entering into God's rest. So what is Sabbath rest? How do we enter into God's rest? Well, let's start by reading Genesis 1. I'm sorry, Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Let's go back to the beginning. Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Uh, if you don't have a Bible and you like one, you can raise your hand right now, and an usher will come down the aisle and bring you one. And again, if you don't own a Bible, please keep that Bible. We love you, and that's our gift to you. So Genesis 2, 1 through 3. It'll also be up on the screen behind me. Here we go. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day, and he made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Now, this is a passage of scripture that I'm sure plenty of us have read or heard many, many times, but I want us to focus on one particular section of these verses. I want us to focus where it says, God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. This word holy in the Hebrew language, it's a very special word, kadesh. Kadesh means holy. And it's a word that points to things that are of God, things that are of God's nature, right? Because God, himself, God cannot be defined. There's no word that really describes God. God is holy other. God is set apart. So God is kadesh. He is holy. And what's interesting here is that the first holy object in the history of the world the first thing that God declared holy was not a mountain or a temple or an altar. It was a period of time. It was Sabbath rest. Sabbath is holy, meant to be set apart. And in the Old Testament, the Jewish people were commanded to regularly practice the Sabbath. In fact, it's number four of the Big Ten, where it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. So, so the Jewish people would, re would regularly set aside an entire 24-hour period where all, worked, all work ceased, and they would gather together in their families, in their communities, and they would take their focus off of the creation 
and put it on the creator. It was a day of gratitude and it was a day of worship. It was a day to just sit with one another and enjoy the presence of the divine. That was the heart of the Sabbath. But then the rules started to come along, rule after rule. At first, there weren't that many, and they were, they were helpful. Rules like no carrying, no lighting a fire, no encouraging other people to work, things like that. But then a group of rabbis got together, and they decided there needs to be more, and they created a list of 39 additional prohibitions, things that you can't do during the Sabbath, including things like no harvesting, no washing, uh, no writing, no erasing, no tearing, no untying, things like that. And then later, rabbis got together again and made even more rules, and it got to the point where it became incredibly difficult to focus on the heart of the Sabbath because everyone was too busy focusing on all the things that they can't do on the Sabbath. And then the consequences for breaking the Sabbath became increasingly severe, ranging from things like being kicked out of your community or your family to being put to death. And that was the situation. This is the setting that Jesus finds himself in in our main passage for today, which is Matthew 12, 1 through 8. Matthew 12, 1 through 8. Let's read it together. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So the Pharisees had caught the disciples plucking heads of grain to eat, which was considered work. That's considered against the Sabbath law, and they called him out for it. And Jesus was not having it. Jesus essentially told them, listen, you are so focused on the letter of the law and catching anyone who would break the law that you have completely missed the point of the Sabbath. If you knew what the heart of the Sabbath was about, you would be focused on God. And if you were focused on God, you would know that God desires mercy and not sacrifice. And then he ends with the mic drop of saying, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Here's what that means. So in the Old Testament, the Israelites believed that God's presence was located in a single location, which was the temple and that God's presence was located in a single period of time, which was the Sabbath. And then Jesus shows up on the scene, who as Christians, we believe Jesus is the fullness of God in the flesh. He is fully divine, fully human. And now God's presence is no longer isolated to a single place or a single time. Now God's presence is walking and talking among them and is available 24-7. And so Sabbath Sabbath rest is no longer about just a specific period of time. Now, Sabbath is about a person. Sabbath rest is about Jesus. I want us to look at what Jesus says just moments before this encounter with the Pharisees. Let's back up just a few verses in Matthew 11, starting in verse 28. Jesus says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So come to me, Jesus says, and I will give your weary souls rest. Sabbath rest is found in Jesus, and it's available to us 24-7. That's good news. We are no longer bound by the law of the Sabbath. That is good news. However, I believe that it is still absolutely critical for Christians to practice the heart of the Sabbath. Because if we don't regularly set aside or set apart time for us to take our focus off of the creation and put it on the creator, then we will never experience this rest that Jesus offers us. 
And while there's no one specific way that we practice the heart of the Sabbath, I do want to give us a few key ingredients that will help us learn how to enter into the rest that Jesus offers us. And the first is that we need to learn to say no to a culture that is constantly demanding a yes. We need to learn to say no to a culture that is constantly demanding a yes. Dr. Brene Brown, who I'm sure many of you have heard of her, she has one of the most famous TED Talks ever, and she's written a ton of books. I think she has a special on Netflix now. She spent years studying people and what makes them tick. And in one of her books called Daring Greatly, she talks about how one of the biggest problems facing our culture today is the mindset of scarcity, the mindset of scarcity. She says this, she says, scarcity is the never enough problem. Scarcity thrives in a culture where everyone is hyper aware of lack. Everything from safety and love to money and resources feels restricted, it feels lacking. So we spend an inordinate amount of time calculating how much we have and want and don't have and how much everyone else has and needs and wants. She then goes on to say that for many of us, our first waking thought of the day is, "Ah, I just didn't get enough sleep. And then our second thought of the day is, "Ah, I don't have enough time. So before we even get out of bed, before our feet even touch the floor, we are already behind. We are already lacking. We are already inadequate. We're already missing something. And that type of thinking is exhausting. Always feeling behind, always feeling like you're lacking. It's exhausting. And it's compounded by the fact that we live in a culture that assigns value to people based on how much they have or how successful they are or what they've achieved or what they can contribute to society. It produces this feeling in all of us that ah, there's always more that I could be doing. Like the work's never done. I can always be better. I can always be more successful. I can always have more, do more, achieve more. And so we work ourselves to the bone because we don't want to be left behind. And that is the trap of the world that we live in. And it's a lie. The patterns of this world will tell you that you better say yes, because if you don't, somebody else will. And then they will move ahead in life, and you will be left behind. Someone else is going to get that promotion. Someone else's kid is going to get that scholarship, and then you are going to feel like a failure. So just keep saying yes until your schedule is overstuffed and you are overstressed. It'll be worth it in the end, I promise. But it never is. That's a lie. That's a lie of the world we live in. Solomon, in the book of Ecclesiastes, he addresses the people who break their back day in and day out, toiling under the sun for profit or for gain. He says that they are striving after the wind. He says that their stress, their sweat, their blood, their tears, their pain, it's all for nothing. It's meaningless. It's vanity. Everything that you accomplish, everything you build, all of your successes, they're all going to turn to dust someday and they're not going to matter anymore. Sabbath rest is about saying no to that meaningless pursuit and about carving out time, setting aside time where we can turn our attention to Jesus who is the source of true rest, who already finds us to be infinitely valuable. Sabbath rest is an opportunity to stop killing ourselves to stop working, to stop the busyness, and then take the time to rest in the truth that you are more loved right now than you could ever know. You are so loved that Jesus willingly embraced death on a cross in order to cast aside your sin and your shame, in order to defeat death on your behalf so that your weary soul can find rest in him for all eternity. That is the gospel truth. And we need margin for God to come to interrupt our day-to-day lives and remind us of that truth. So that instead of focusing on what we have or don't have or on our successes or on our failures, we instead can focus on who Jesus is and who Jesus says we are. Now you may be wondering, okay, well, how much is this going to cost me? Like, what kind of margin are we talking about here? Give it to me in hours. 
And so uh, <laughs> I'm not going to prescribe an amount of time you should set aside each week, but I will say this. You should create enough space in your life that it is evident that Sabbath rest is a priority for you. You should create enough space that it is evident that Sabbath is a priority for you. So Jewish people, contemporary Jewish people who observe the Sabbath, they will spend days every single week preparing for the Sabbath, where they'll go and collect and buy and prepare all of their food they're going to eat on that day. They will go and tie up all loose ends at work and with their family and friends. They will make sure to check off as many things as possible on their to-do list in order to ensure that they have no temptation to work the moment that the sun sets on Friday night. Now, do we have to do all of those things? No, we don't have to. But here's the point. For Jewish people, the Sabbath is not a means to an end. In other words, they don't treat the Sabbath as a time to rest and recharge their batteries so that they can then go back to work. The Sabbath is the end for them. The Sabbath is what they are working towards every single week. The Sabbath is the priority. Work is never the priority. And that's how I believe we need to treat Sabbath rest. We need to treat this time that we set aside. It needs to be a priority for us. So is it one 24-hour period every week? Or is it like one hour every single weekday and then four hours on Saturday and Sunday? Is it three hours, three times a week? That's up to you, and that's up to your schedule. Whatever works for you, but it needs to be a priority. It needs to be the one part of your weekly schedule that you don't sacrifice for something else. It must be a priority. So what do we do during the Sabbath? What is it that we're supposed to do? Again, this can look like a thousand different things for us. For contemporary Jewish people, they observed a strict 24-hour period where they do no business whatsoever. They don't even spend any money on that day. Uh, They don't tackle anything on the the to-do list. They don't ride in cars. They don't uh, use the internet. They don't use the TV. None of that. And some of you are thinking, how is that even possible? And it is. It's, It's absolutely possible. It's incredibly difficult. And again, do we have to do those things? No. Some of us probably should every once in a while, but we don't have to do those things. But it's important for us to see that for Jewish people, the Sabbath is not simply a day off. It's an entirely different mode of being in order to reconnect with God and with one another. And that's how we need to treat the Sabbath, as a priority in which we live in a totally different way than we typically do. And so here's some of the practices that I, can, that I think can help us kind of move into that different mode of being. So Sabbath should be a time of reading and talking about Scripture with one another. It's a time for us to pause our story and see where we fit in in God's story, a story that still continues to this day. Sabbath should also be a time of prayer, a time in which we talk to God about anything and everything, including our our anxieties and our burdens, but it's also time for us to just be still and listen and give give the Holy Spirit some room to speak to us. We oftentimes don't realize that we are constantly, there are things in this world, people in this world that are constantly pulling for our attention constantly pulling for our allegiances. And so if we don't take that time to stop and just listen, then we're never going to really hear from God. It's going to be like trying to have a conversation at a Metallica concert. It's going to be very difficult to do. We need that time that we set aside to just be quiet and just be still and just listen. Give the Holy Spirit some room to speak to us. And the Sabbath should also be a time of community. It's a time to gather together with family or with friends to encourage one another, to worship together, to read scripture together, to laugh and have fun and eat a good meal together. But the ingredient of Sabbath that I want to spend uh, the rest of our time really talking about today is that Sabbath should be about gratitude. Sabbath should be about gratitude. When we take that time to stop busying ourselves and to stop running around, that gives us the opportunity to look around and actually take in our surroundings. And when we stop and look around, we will start to see all these little miracles that we normally miss when we are in a hurry. We will start to see all of these gifts from God that we typically just consume without a second thought. A few days ago, I was actually trending back towards that kind of dark, anxious, uh, exhausted 
place. And my wife and I, we just had our second daughter back in June, so she's roughly two months old. Her name's Scarlett. And we are still working on getting her to sleep through the night. And some nights are fine, other nights are not fine at all. And this particular night, I had stayed up really late working on this sermon, actually. And when I finally decided it's time to go to bed, I crept up the stairs as quietly as I possibly could. And I turned the door handle real slowly. And I pushed the door open. And listen, before this moment, I had never heard my door make a single creak or groan. (laughs) But just then, it sounded like my door hadn't been open in a hundred years. It just like, it groaned so loudly. And of course, Scarlett wakes up and I can hear her start fussing. It's like, ugh. So I go and I pick her up, and I go and sit in the rocking chair in the corner of our room, and I start to rock her to get her back to sleep, and I lay my head back, and I close my eyes, and I just start thinking about all these things that are making me anxious. First, I think about how in the morning I'm going to go buy a gallon of WD-40 to pour all over the hinges of our door. (laughs) And then I started thinking about things like finances, and things like... Uh, just like the to-do list in our house, all the chores that are just piling up so much so that it feels like we're never going to get through them. And I started thinking about work. And I started thinking about this sermon. And then I started thinking about how I'm about to preach that we need to take time to stop and look around and see God's gifts all around us. Maybe I should practice what I preach. So <laughs> I opened my eyes and I looked around. And I looked down, and Scarlett had stopped fussing, and now she's just staring at me. And she's got this big grin on her face. And she's like, she's barely two months old, and she's smiling so big that like, it looks like her eyes are smiling, you know? And the exhaustion and the anxiety just melted away, even if it was just for that moment. And my heart was just full of joy and gratitude and love, and immediately I hugged her close, and I started praying, and I gave thanks, and you better believe that was a hug of worship. In that moment, I was just so thankful in that moment, and it was a moment that if I had not stopped to look around, I would have missed it. I would have missed that gift from God. Scarlet is a gift. That little smile was a miracle, and I would have missed it if I had not stopped to look around. And so Sabbath rest, I think, it gives us the eyes to see that the earth is crammed with heaven. Sabbath rest gives us eyes to look around and see all of all of God's gifts that he gives us that we normally just consume without a second thought. I mean, think about it. It's 101 degrees outside, and it's 73 degrees in here. Praise God. Am I right? Amen. Amen. (sighs) But how often do we stop and just think about little things like that? I mean, that's a big thing, but how often do we stop and take stock of the countless gifts that God gives us and then give him thanks and praise as the giver of all good gifts? Or do we just go around and consume without giving a second thought? See, the patterns of this world, they condition us to just mindlessly consume and then to hoard and to gather until we are exhausted. But practicing Sabbath rest means seeing everything in life as a gift from God and then giving thanks and praise to him as the father and giver of all good things. The Apostle Paul has something really interesting to say about gratitude. Uh, In his letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, 4 through 5, Paul says this, For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, then it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. Everything in life, everything around you is a gift from God. Look around, everything is a gift from God. Your life, your breath, your spouse, your children, your house, your car, music, movies, trees, animals, mountains, oceans, everything in life is a gift from God. And practicing Sabbath rest teaches us to receive everything in life as a gift. Sabbath rest reminds us that God's gifts are not meant to just be consumed. They're meant to be enjoyed. 
And God's gifts are not meant to be hoarded. They're meant to be shared. A couple of weeks ago, TA uh, gave us a challenge to actually sit and think and write down some of the things that we are grateful for. And I want to re-up that challenge. When you set aside time this week, when you set aside that time for Sabbath rest, I want you to sit down and just look around you and think and write down all the things that you're grateful for. Everything that you see that's good, write them all down. You will be amazed at how quickly you fill up a page of paper. Just start writing. Your spouse, running water, your children laughing and playing, Girl Scout cookies, whatever it is that you see, right? Just write those things down. And then when the page is full, just read over it and give thanks and give praise. And then go take that list and go show it to someone else and then talk to them about how good our God is. That sounds like an excellent way to start off your Sabbath rest. And listen, I know, I know that Sabbath rest is not easy to come by. Truly, I do, I get it. I have two kids, a two-year-old and a two-month-old. And so sleep is rare and precious. And I have a full-time job. I have a mortgage. I have all those anxieties and those stresses. But I'm telling you that it's absolutely possible for you to practice Sabbath rest every single week if you make it a priority. And your Sabbath rest, that is a time for you to not check your phones constantly. That is a time for you to let the emails pile up, for you to not worry about the meeting that you have tomorrow. It's a time for you to stop checking Facebook or Instagram every 10 minutes so you can compare or criticize or covet the lives of others. Sabbath rest is a time for you to just be. Just be still in the presence of God and with one another. And whatever it is that focuses your eyes on Jesus and fills your heart with gratitude and worship, focus on those things. So Sabbath is going to look a little bit different for everyone. Maybe your Sabbath is full of nature or good conversation or music or hanging out with your grow group, whatever it is. I'll say this. You'll know that you are experiencing Sabbath rest when you don't just feel recharged afterwards but you feel like you are more whole. Like you'll know that you're experiencing Sabbath rest when you feel that peace in your soul that tells you like, oh, this is how life is supposed to be lived. I get it, like this is the life that God created us for. A life that's full of worship and gratitude and love and joy and community. This is what it's all about. I get it now. It's because Sabbath rest gives us a taste of God's kingdom when we enter into God's rest, when we practice God's rest, that is a chance to peel back the veil and get a glimpse into the future. And that one day when God's kingdom fully arrives and we fully enter into God's rest and there's no more working, no more toiling, no more exhaustion, no more stress, Sabbath rest is an opportunity for us to practice right now living in God's kingdom. And so I want to try a prayer exercise with all of us. Uh, and it's gonna take in some, bu- it's gonna take some buy-in on your part uh, because it involves our imagination. I believe that our imagination is a gift from God and I believe that our imagination can be used for holy purposes. We can have a holy imagination. And so what that's gonna require from you is to just buy in to this moment right now. I know there can be some cynicism when we do things like this. I get it, that's how I normally act, but just put that aside and with all the sincerity that you can muster, try to just really be present in this moment. I'm gonna ask us all to close our eyes. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, as best as I can, knowing that God's kingdom is gonna be so much more than we could ever imagine, but I'm gonna try my best to paint a picture of that day when we fully enter into God's rest, when we fully enter into God's kingdom. So just clear your minds. Let the anxieties and the stresses of the day melt away, at least for this moment. Be fully present here and just listen to these words. Try to imagine it. The book of Revelation describes God's kingdom as a wedding feast, a party. And so I want us to imagine right now the best wedding reception you've ever been to. 
Not the awkward ones where you don't know anyone or there's not enough finger foods or they only have unsweet and nice tea. But you walk into this wedding feast and you know everyone. Everywhere you turn is great conversation and laughter. And then you notice the spread. It's all your favorite foods. It's filet, lobster, roasted asparagus, bread. Cakes have more tears than you can count. And there's a live band there. It's not some fake DJ with an iPod shuffle. It's a real band. And they're actually good. And they're playing all of your favorite songs. And everyone is dancing. Not like when a handful of people are dancing and they awkwardly try to pull other people onto the dance floor. I mean, everyone is dancing. And then you see Jesus. He's right in front of you right now. And he's looking right at you. This man who you've heard about, who you've read about, who you've talked to for so long is now right in front of you. He's looking directly at you. His eyes are warm and welcoming, smiling. His arms are open wide. And what you're feeling is this unexplainable, supernatural feeling where every molecule in your body is filled with a joy and a love so profound that you feel like you might explode. But you know you won't because the word that spoke the universe into existence is standing right in front of you. And then you feel something else a feeling that you haven't really had since you were a small child. That feeling when you were with your parents and you just felt safe and you know, you know, you know that everything is going to be okay. That feeling of pure peace just completely envelops you as you are wrapped in the presence of the divine and you finally understand, you finally get what it means to be in a place where there is no more pain no more tears, no more toiling, no more mourning, no more death. Now you can just be. You can just rest in the presence of your creator for all eternity. Father, I know there are people here who their souls are so weary and they're so tired And they don't know if they'll ever catch their breath again, if they'll ever be able to keep their head above water. There's just so much to do. Father, I pray that right now, I ask that your Holy Spirit is moving in them in a way that fills them with assurance that true rest is coming and true rest is available even right now, that true rest is found in you and you alone that there is nothing that we have to do, nothing we have to accomplish to earn your love, to be seen as valuable in your eyes, to feel like we matter. Father, remind us that there's a day coming where we don't have to work anymore. We just get to be with you in a constant state of joy and worship and love. Father, Remind us that that day is coming because you love us so much right now, right as we are. Father, I just ask that your spirit moves in all of us to make the Sabbath rest a priority in our lives. Give us eyes to see the parts of our schedule that we can say no to, that we can cut out so that we can create margin for you to move into our lives, to remind us the gospel truth that you love us. Father, we're just so incredibly thankful for your love, for the rest that you offer right now and the eternal rest that is to come.